Good evening, everyone. I'm Janet Steinmeier. I'm uh, the president of Lesley University, and it's my very great pleasure to welcome you tonight and to introduce tonight's very special guest speaker, Chief Lynn Malariba. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to take a moment to read Leslie's land acknowledgement, which I'm reading to you tonight from Leslie's South Campus in Cambridge. We would like to acknowledge the traditional occupants of this land on which this meeting is taking place, as well as honor what this land means to the culture and traditions of those who originate, originally occupied this space. We acknowledge that where we are right now is on the traditional homelands of the Massachusetts people, and they are still with us today. We also acknowledge their neighbors and relatives, the Nipmuc and Wampanoag peoples. In addition, we extend a welcome to any Aboriginal, Native American, and or First Nation people joining us this evening. I'd also like to warmly Welcome and thank Hans Straub. Hans is the uh, chairman of Leslie's Board of Trustees and his generous gift makes possible the annual Straub Masa Visiting Artist Lecture Series that brings us tonight's speaker, as well as a second uh, speaker next month, artist Julia Powell on April 14th. Thank you, Hans. We're so grateful for all that you do for Leslie. And now it's my very great honor and pleasure to introduce our speaker and my good friend, Mohegan Chief, Many Hearts, Marilyn Lynn Malerba. The Many Hearts in her Mohegan name come from her long career as a registered nurse. Before she retired, Lynn was the Director of Cardiology and Pulmonary Service at Lawrence and Memorial Hospital in New London, Connecticut. As Lynn tells the story of how her tribal name was chosen, the tribe's medicine woman said, we're going to call you Chief Many Hearts because you've held many hearts in your hands in the past. And now as chief, you'll hold our hearts in your hands and care for us in a very personal way as well. The role of chief is to protect and oversee the tribe's cultural traditions and to represent the Mohegan people's needs and wishes. She is her tribe's most powerful advocate. And as you will learn from her talk tonight, a strong advocate for the rights of all native and indigenous people. Prior to her being named chief by the Council of Elders, Lynn was chairwoman of the Mohegan Tribal Council, which runs their government and businesses. As chief, she has a national platform. She is chairwoman of the Tribal Advisory Committee for Indian Health Services. She serves on the Department of Justice's Tribal Nations Leadership Council and on the Treasury Department's Tribal Advisory Committee, as well as the National Institute of Health Advisory Committee. In addition, she is secretary for the United South and Eastern Tribes Sovereignty Protection Fund, which includes all 30 tribes east of the Mississippi, plus one in Texas, that advocate together for policy at the federal level. Lynn is the first female chief in the Mohegan tribe's modern history. So it's especially fitting that she joins us during Women's History Month. Her medical and public health background, she earned a doctor of nursing practice at Yale, makes her an exceptionally well-qualified leader during this pandemic time when indigenous communities have been hit especially hard due to a combination of longstanding health disparities and the chronic underfunding of Indian health services. You'll hear tonight that healthcare is one of the many broken promises to native peoples. For me personally, it's such a pleasure to bring Lynn to Leslie, though I wish very much that we were able to do it in person and I hope that one day will be the case. Lynn and I met about six years ago when I was president of Mitchell College in New London. And as two women leaders in the close-knit Southeastern Connecticut region, we bonded over the commonalities we discovered leading our respective communities of college and tribe. 
We forged a close relationship through our quarterly breakfasts at the wonderful M Bar in Mystic, which unfortunately is a casualty of the pandemic. But that's where we would indulge in conversation and some of the most cheesy eggs and richest muffins in Connecticut. I have to say I treasured those breakfasts. I left them with new insights and energy despite the cheesy eggs. I learned so very much from Lynn and I know she has much to teach us tonight. So on behalf of the entire Leslie community, I'm deeply honored to welcome Chief Many Hearts Lynn Malerba to our Zoom stage, Lynn. Well, I just thank you so much. I would say thank you to my friend, President Steinmeier. I miss you here in Southeastern Connecticut. And I know that the Leslie University community has gained a real advocate. Uh, and I thank the entire Leslie University community for your kind invitation to speak today, especially the Board of Trustees. I truly thank you for your land acknowledgement and I join you in acknowledging my Massachusetts Wampanoag and Nipmuc cousins and the land that we are on. I myself am coming to you from the land of the Nihantics who no longer exist in Connecticut, which is a very sad state of affairs. Um, so I'm just very pleased to be here and I'm so thankful that you think that this is a topic you'd like to hear more about. And the Tiwi Songsquam Mutahash, my name is Chief Many Hearts. And you know exactly why I was named Chief Many Hearts, and I am honored to carry this name, and I'm honored that our medicine woman bestowed the name upon me. I follow in the footsteps of great leaders in, in our tribal community, including my great-grandfather, Chief Mataga, and my mother, Loretta Robers, who served on our council for 30 years. Our tribal government has continued uninterrupted since the time of first contact. So I wanted to share with you this second slide. Um, it's, um, it's a map of Connecticut, and I know it's really hard to see, but it's a map of Connecticut at the time of first contact with our European immigrants. And what you'll see are there, all of the place names are native, and all of the land masses are attributed to the tribes that lived on them. Connecticut in and, of, is, in and of itself is a native name. It's Quinnetucket and it means long tidal river. So that was where a lot of our native people resided was along the rivers and along the shoreline. Um, next slide, please. Unfortunately, 90% of all our tribal people perished in the first century following contact and 90% of lands were taken from the first peoples of the state. Our diplomatic relations were initially with Europe prior to the formulation of the United States. Our unbroken tribal sovereignty and exercise of that sovereignty remain extremely important to us. We expect that the United States government engage with us as a sovereign nation and that all of its agencies do the same in the realm of trust and treaty obligation. So on this slide, what you see is the doctrine of discovery and its implications. What happened was in the 1500s, medieval Europe decided that they would divide up the continent that is the Americas between France, Spain, and England. And they felt that no matter who they encountered when they came to these lands, those inhabitants were to be subjugated, that they could be Christianized, they could convert to Catholicism or Christianity, but that they would always be servile and would never be an equal to the people that came to these lands. That's the basis of the United States sovereign right to extinguish the native people's right of occupancy, or as they called it, manifest destiny. We've asked the uh, Pope to um, recount those papal bulls that established this doctrine of discovery, and we will continue to do so because we're nothing if not persistent. So next slide, please. So as we think about our relationships and we think about first contact, you know, we lost so much, you know, our, our land base, our population due to diseases that we had no immunity to. Our life changed greatly because we were hunters and gatherers. We were forced into an agrarian caste-based society. We were assigned overseers because in the very paternalistic way that the European immigrants viewed us, we were not capable of managing our own affairs. And what the reduction of those hunting grounds um, meant 
was that we were no longer able to feed ourselves in our indigenous way and to gather our plant medicines. And slowly but surely, all of those areas became toxic and became polluted. We were expected to convert to um, Christianity. And it really, it was very difficult for us during that time because it enforced dependency upon the people who settled here. But yet we had diplomatic relationships with the crowns of Europe. In fact, one of our chiefs, Chief Mohammed, died in Europe while he was beseeching King George to return our lands. And because he died in Europe and we were too impoverished to bring him back, he is buried outside of the city limits in, in Southwark because he was a man of color and could not be buried within the city limits of London. Um, next slide, please. And so there's, this is um, a petition uh, that went to the Assembly of the State of Connecticut, and it was presented by both male and female Mohegan leaders. And I think that was unique during that time as well and unheard of, um, that there would be both men and women in leadership positions, because surely that did not happen with the people who settled on our shores. Now, this is a very romanticized petition, but they wanted to make their point, and I'm not going to read it to you necessarily because you can see it on the screen, but what it was talking about was the fact that, you know, our way of life had changed very greatly. And they talk about being changed upside down, um, chiefly by the help of the white people who came here. And it talks about the fact that we were hunters and gatherers and all of a sudden things had changed, you know, that we were unable to um, go to our, our traditional hunting grounds and that all of a sudden the lands were being taken from us and fenced in. Um, so next slide, please. So this continues on the next slide and it talks about the fact that now we have to work our land, we have to keep cattle and horses and hogs. And interestingly that the settlers, while they fenced in their lands and they fenced in the cattle and the horses, they did not fence in their pigs and the pigs ruined our shellfish beds because they rooted around through the shellfish beds and they ruined them. And that was a real source of nutrition for us as well as you know, um, indigenous jewelry because as you know, the quahog shells are very important to us. And it's a way for us to, number one, adorn ourselves, but number two, also provide tribute. It's, it's not cash. Um, wampum is not cash. It really was a means of providing tribute to someone if they had done something really well. Um, and then the last slide, please. And next slide, I should say. Um, just talks about what we want. We really want to be left alone. We want to live our lives without any interference, you know, leave us alone. We're very happy that you're here, but we do want to live separate lives. And as you all know, that didn't work out quite so well for us. Next slide, please. So in the meantime, while that was happening, the Mohegan tribe was suing the colony of Connecticut in the courts in London. And we actually won that lawsuit. Um, and what um, the courts found was that we were a separate and distinct people from the people who came to our shores, that we had a separate quality, that we had a separate culture, and that we had separate lands. And so what they talked about was the fact that we should live side by side, but we shouldn't really impact one another. Our political unit should not have jurisdiction over the other. And that's how we really describe sovereignty, that we are our own tribal nation, that we have our own sets of laws, and that they should be respected if you come onto our lands. Just as if someone from the state of Massachusetts went into the state of Rhode Island, you're going to respect those laws. Um, and so we won on appeal, uh, but on the second appeal, that ruling was overturned. And we, again, had devastating losses of our, our lands. Uh, next slide, please. So we've had this vacillating Indian policy since time of first contact. You know, at first it was all about assimilation. You know, we should be Christianized, we should be farmers, you know, we should live the same, we should live the same life that the people who settled here came to, which is very ironic given the fact that the people who settled here were looking for uh, religious freedom, but yet they didn't afford that to the people that they encountered here on these shores. I mean, and then it was about relocation. We were very lucky that we did not have to relocate to Oklahoma or other states. And um, once it was determined that our lands were fertile and that they were worthy of being developed and um, were a source of wealth. Um, but we held on to our land as long as we could. We had a, a, a much difficulty doing so, um, but we are pleased that we are still here and we're still in Connecticut. 
Um, and then there was an era of treaty making, which is an exchange between, between two sovereigns. One sovereign has something that the other one wants. And so what is the exchange and what will happen during that point in time? And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then there was termination. There were tribes that were told that they were no longer tribes, that they were terminated. Um, and our good friends in Wisconsin, the Menominee tribe, that happened to them. They were very impoverished. And the Bureau of Indian Affairs went and chatted with them and said, listen, you know what? We'll give each member of the tribe a sum of money if you decide that you will no longer be a tribe and that you will disband your reservation. And your reservation can either stay a reservation and become a state park or we'll divide it up amongst you. Um, so they decided that they would keep the land intact, but then they no longer had any access to any services through the federal government. So their sawmill went silent, their hospital went into decline, and they were no longer able to provide for their people. Um, and it wasn't until I want to say the 1970s, um, that they were re-recognized by the federal government. And that happened time and time again in the United States. And so there was a period of reorganization after that. And now we're in the era of self-determination and self-governance, which is the federal government has a trust and treaty obligation to our native nations. And they have agreed to those in the trust and treaty obligations they have set for themselves. And instead of providing services to tribal nations in a very paternalistic way, in the way that the federal government sees fit, what they do is they transfer the funds that they normally would have appropriated for those tribes. And the tribes then make the decision about what their priorities are for their community and how they will provide those services in very culturally sensitive ways. Next slide, please. So we entered into this treaty era in the 1800s and, and treaties were considered exchanges between two sovereigns. Tribes exchanged much um, in terms of land, mineral, water rights in exchange for the provision of healthcare, education, and other social benefit programs. And those treaties sometimes were very explicit in terms of what the tribe believed was going to happen. Um, and so, you know, over what was now over 100% of land owned by Native tribes is now just 3% of the total United States land base. What we found was that even today, of the $20 trillion in resources gained from natural resources and other sources of revenue on federal lands in Indian country, Indian country appropriations is only $0.02 trillion or 0.1% of the federal budget. So given the severe and chronic underfunding of all Indian programs, it's easy to see that the United States has not lived up to their treaty obligations. And in fact, the, the funding has remained stagnant. So each year, um, the services that tribes can purchase with that funding is less, not more. Next slide, please. So here you see a map of Indian country today. This is a BIA map, Bureau of Indian Affairs map. And I share this with you because if you look at the Mississippi River, look at the severe devastation of all the tribes east of the Mississippi. Look, you can hardly see where you know, tribal lands are and where our land bases are and how much our population declined. And that's a map from today. Uh, next slide, please. And so we viewed tra uh, treaties as social, legal, and moral contracts. Um, so if contracts are based on, on the ideal of reciprocity, um, then why has the United States negated the contracts that they signed into with the federal, with the uh, tribal nations? And you know, one of the, the questions that we need to ask is that did the colonial and subsequent governments operate with a different understanding of the value of what was being negotiated than what the tribes thought was being negotiated? And it is interesting that the tribes did not have a seat at the table when these laws were passed, nor could they vote for legislators until 1934. Next slide, please. Um, and the relationship with the federal government is long articulated in constitution, in laws, in the canons of construction, and in case law. Here's a few of the laws that um, still guide us to this day. One of the interesting things that I think we should talk a little bit about, so while the Snyder Act in 1921 authorized funds for the relief of distress and conservation of health and for the employment of physicians throughout um, Indian country, 
the Indian Health Service itself initially started as part of the War Department during the Civil War uh, because they thought that they needed to protect the health of the indigenous peoples so that they would not um, spread communicable diseases to the soldiers that were fighting during the Civil War. And I think you can all see the irony in that, given the fact that we were just, we were the first people to experience germ warfare with the blankets that were infested with smallpox. Uh, the Indian Reorganization Act was passed after the Miriam Report. The Miriam Report was a group of uh, people who went out into Indian country to identify what the living conditions and health conditions of Indians were. And they said that it, the conditions were just deplorable. And so they thought they really needed to think about how they would deal with this in a different way. So they decided that the tribes that still existed um, would then begin to receive services under the Indian Re Reorganization Act. And I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. The Indian Self-Determination Education Act was passed in recognition of the right for tribes to be self-governing in terms of how services were provided, rather than how the great white father would think that those services should be provided. Next slide. So this is a photo of my great grandfather, Chief Mataga. And I wanna talk a little bit about blood quantum because that factors into our next discussion uh, on the Indian Reorganization Act. Blood quantum is a colonial construct. And what that does is it talks about, well, who is an Indian and who is not an Indian. And during the time of my great grandfather, um, we had overseers assigned to us and they were the ones that were keeping the records of our tribal roles, who was a tribal citizen and who was not. They were not accurate. Um, they went a lot by um, your physical appearance and or the where you resided and if you if they thought that you had a connection to the tribe. But who is a tribal member or a, a tribal citizen is decided by the tribal nation. It's not just blood. It's an intricate relationship of culture, place, uh, political relations and social relations. And, you know, our medicine woman, Fidelia Fielding, always talked about the importance of place and land. And in fact, she was quoted as saying, you shall always remain where your ancestors are. So the Indian Reorganization Act was a means to provide services to tribal people. Um, and through that, the Bureau of Indian Affairs said, well, if you are a tribe, you need to have a constitution, you need to have a governing body. And part of that discussion was, you know, developing that constitution and who gets to be Indians. So next slide, please. So when we think about the Merriam Report and we think about the Indian Reorganization Act, um, there was a lot of discussion about blood quantum in the constitutional piece of that. And the commissioner of uh, Indian Affairs said, well, I think that in order to be a tribal member and to be a tribal citizen and qualify as an Indian, you should be 25% Indian blood. Um, and the Senate Indian Affairs um, uh, chairman, Wheeler, said, no, 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 we're trying to get rid of the Indian problem, not create more. I think it should be 50% Indian blood. But again, if you go back to my previous comments, it's not just about blood. Tribes are political entities. They are governing bodies. We get to decide who our citizens are just like any other country gets to decide who their citizens are. So many tribes use descendancy, but the problem is that the Bureau of Indian Affairs wrote some of the constitutions for tribes. And of course they wrote blood quantum into the constitutions of those tribes. Why? Because at some point they believed that then the federal trust and treaty obligation to those tribes would be extinguished. And so now you have uh, the sense that for some tribes you have parents who are considered a full tribal member, and you have children who have no rights within the tribe except to say that they are descended from that tribe. That was exactly the intent of the Indian Reorganization Act and exactly the intent of writing those constitutions are for those tribes. We're fortunate because we did not accept that constitution. We have our own governing document. And the tribes that did accept that constitution um, have to go back to the Bureau of Indian Affairs anytime they want a constitutional amendment. So you can imagine that's not working really well today. So there's been several reports on what since the Merriam report. One was um, a quiet crisis. The last one was um, the U U.S. Commission on Civil Rights report, a quiet crisis, federal funding, and unmet needs in Indian country. Um, and what happened was um, in order to um, get 
to get to that point, the Quiet Crisis in 2003 noted that Native Americans continue to rank at or near the bottom of every social health and economic indicator. And again, funding has not gone up. So those health indicators really have not improved much. Next slide, please. So we have to talk a little bit now about the, the follow-up report to that, which is Broken Promises. Um, and the title of the report says it all, Continued Federal Funding Shortfall for Native Americans. And there were some very key points here, and I think they're salient points, that the United States expects all other nations to live up to their treaty obligations, so it should live up to their own. We in Indian country have long known about the deplorable conditions that our first peoples face. The findings of the Broken Promise Report are markedly and distressingly similar to the now 16-year-old Quiet Crisis Report, which resulted after years of advocacy from Indian nations and organizations seeking an update to the 2003 report. This report confirms what we already know in Indian country, that with minor exceptions, the United States continues to neglect its most basic obligations to tribal nations. These chronic failures have persisted throughout changes in administration in Congress. It's time that both the legislative and executive branches confront and correct them. We cannot continue to study this issue, action is needed. There is a humanitarian crisis within our own United States and this cannot be allowed to continue. The United South and Eastern tribes, the Federal Interior Budget Council and others across Indian country are calling for congressional oversight hearings to amplify the findings of the Broken Promises Report and hold the executive branch accountable for these continuing fa failures. The commission found that the funding of trust and treaty obligations remains grossly inadequate and a barely perceptible and decreasing percentage of the agency budgets. Inadequate funding throughout Indian country needs to be viewed as unfilled trust and treaty obligation. This funding is not delivered on the basis of poverty or for social welfare purposes. The federal government's trust obligations are the result of millions of acres of land and extensive resources ceded to the United States in exchange for what it is legally and morally obligated to provide benefits and services in perpetuity. At no point in our history has our government fully developed, delivered on these organizations. Next, next slide, please. So here's the impact of the chronic underfunding of trust and treaty obligations. And I'm not gonna read it to you, but you can just take a look at, these are just, you know, just kind of selected statistics. And you can go through the report and see many, many more statistics in terms of how this has really impacted uh, tribal nations. And just think about this a little bit. Um, if you think about all the social determinants of health, you can imagine how tribes have been hard, hard hit with this pandemic. We had very difficult health status um, issues to deal with as it was. So layer a pandemic on top of that, and we are really struggling here. And one of the things I'd like to share is, you know, the tribal lands are 4% of the overall land base in the United States, but 25% of all Superfund sites are on Indian lands. How does that impact our health and how is that fair? And how do we get to the point of environmental justice along with other forms of justice for tribal nations? Next slide, please. And here's a, just a, a few other you know, um, statistics, but this is really our very own humanitarian crisis. How do you deal with a pandemic when you don't have complete plumbing and you can't wash your hands in, inside? How do you educate your children if there is not broadband access to your reservation in a, in a pandemic when everything is virtual? How do we get people to care if you don't have a telephone and you need to call for emergency assistance? And all of these have been really challenging for tribes. Imagine not being able to isolate when someone has COVID. A lot of health clinics don't even have isolation rooms that they can isolate a COVID patient. And when you think about food on reservations, um, think about you know these food deserts. You know, for you know hundreds of miles. You know, I was out in um, North Dakota. There was one grocery store within an hour's ride. Well, if you are impoverished and you don't have enough gas to drive to a grocery store, where are you getting your food? You're getting your food at the gas station and convenience stores. Next slide, please. So the United Nations has a declaration on the rights of indigenous people. And we're thrilled that they decided to take 
that up as a topic. And actually we're trying to advocate for native people to be part of the United Nations and to have their own delegates to the United Nations. This was passed in 2004 with four member states voting against. Interestingly, it was Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the United States. Finally, the United States signed, but they were the last member state to sign on to the declaration. We believe, next slide please. Um, so we believe that the principles in this document should guide the relationship between the federal government and our indigenous tribes. Next slide, please. So again, you know, I can't stress enough that trust and treaty obligations are not discretionary. There is no branch of the federal government that should be permit permitted to unilaterally decide whether to comply with treaties and other legally binding agreements. There are more than 20 federal agencies provided um, to that provide targeted services to Native Americans. They're all underfunded. They're not coordinated. There's overlap in programming. There's multiple means of accessing the programs. Multiple reporting vehicles are required. And many of them are grant funded. We believe that all Native programs should be mandatorily funded. They should be on the mandatory side of the budget, not the discretionary side of the budget. If this is a trust and treaty obligation, why are our programs on the discretionary side of the budget when other programs are not? For instance, the Veterans uh, Health Program is on the mandatory side of the budget. Medicare and Medicaid is on the mandatory side of the budget, and yet Indian Health Services is on the discretionary side of the budget. We are the only people that have trust and treaty obligations and rights to healthcare, and yet we're on the discretionary side of the budget. It has been suggested by some administrations that federal funding and accommodations for tribal nations and their citizens are race-based and therefore unconstitutional. We absolutely categorically disagree with that. All federal Indian programs are based on a political government to government relationship between the United States and tribal nations. Treaty obligations should not be grant funded and they should be on the mandatory side of the budget. It is time to modernize this relationship between tribes and the United States government, given the fact that the assumptions from the 19th century were that Indian people were incompetent to handle their own affairs, that Indian tribes were anachronistic, and that they would disappear. The Constitution, treaties, laws, and canons of construction recognize the role of the United States government in upholding the trust and treaty obligations that they agreed to so long ago when formulating this United States. Next slide, please. So we believe that respect for tribal sovereignty has a long way to go. True consultation requires a seat at the table at the highest levels within the administration. And in each, a special advisory committee should be developed. Only then can a true nation to nation relationship be effective at achieving parity, equity, and justice for American Indians and Alaska Natives. That's just the first step. Consultation is more than just listening. It is getting to an agreement on how best to proceed. And equally important, whenever we make a decision about policy, we need to revisit those agreements to ensure that they're working as intended. Um, and if there are unintended consequences that we address them. Next slide, please. And so this is truly, I think, a well-held value for all Native people, that we're responsible to those who came before, but we are also responsible for those we have yet to meet. As uh, my daughter said during one of her, her speeches, she said, you know what, we have to be good ancestors too. At some point, we will be ancestors. We need to make sure that our actions are those that respect those that will come after us and that will take care of them always. And so with that, um, I will conclude my comments. Again, I am just so thankful for being invited to come and speak with you. I hope that my comments at least stimulate a little thought in terms of what this relationship could be like, should be like, and, and how we will all work together to get there. Lynn, thank you so much uh, for that catalyzing um, um, uh, presentation. Um, I can't thank you enough for coming to Leslie and sharing um, so much of your deep understanding of the um, trials of, 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 
uh, getting um, things into the right place. Um, and now I'd just love to open this up to our community. Um, I think Liz, are you there? Liz Walker, who is part of our president's office, um, who maybe can help us um, bring forward the questions of everybody on this Zoom call. Yes, thank you so much, Lynn. That was really, really fascinating. Um, and we do have a couple of questions coming in, but um, if people could feel free, if you do have questions, you can enter them right into the Q&A box um, and then I can pull them up and ask them to Lynn. Um, so our first question is from Julius. And Julius asks, um, can you discuss, Lynn, how the Mohegan Congregational Church assisted the tribe in their acknowledgement petition? Oh, sure. That's a great question. Of course, you know, I'm trying to limit my comments, but that is a huge, huge part of our ability to remain on our lands. So Sam Samaka, who some of you may know, helped found Dartmouth, decided he was leaving Connecticut. He was done with Connecticut policies. He went to Wisconsin and uh, formed his own tribe, the Brotherton tribe, with other like-minded individuals. His sister, Lucy Ockham Tecumwas, decided that she was going to donate land to our Mohegan people along with her daughter, Cynthia Hoscott. So they donated a parcel of land to the Mohegan people for as long as a Mohegan tribal member walked this earth. So that was the last part of our reservation that was left. Our burial grounds were taken by eminent domain and made into a state park. One was buried over and a building uh, was built on top of it. And another one was part, you know, buried under a ball field at one point in time. And so while you know, they donated the land, there were philanthropists in the city of Norwich, women who were not Mohegan, Sarah Huntington being one of them, who were worried about our tribal people and said, we don't want them to have to leave. They're living in difficult conditions. Let us build a church for them. Let's fundraise and build a church for them. Now, of course, that was part of the overall plan anyway to assimilate us, right, to become you know, Christianized. Um, but they, they fundraised and they built a church and it was called the Mohegan Congregational Church and both Mohegan people attended as well as non-Mohegan people, our, our neighbors. And we've always been part of our neighboring community. But what's interesting about that church was it was our social center, it was our governmental center, it was a school for a part time. And as I call it, it was the underground of Mohegan because we had this ladies sewing society that would meet there that was very prominent women in Mohegan. Um, and so, you know, to the outsider, it would look like nothing to see here. We're just making quilts, right? But what they were doing was speaking the language, passing along our cultural traditions, passing along our native spirituality, and key, and selecting some of the tribal leaders in their little coffee clutch. Um, so the church is a very, very um, important um, sacred space for us. And we consider it a, a place of good spirits. And in fact, whenever there's something really important, such as um, swearing in a new tribal council, which I get to do now, um, you know, we hold it at the church. And when I was announced as the chief, that announcement was at the church. And our medicine women, woman said, you know, our ancestors were with us. I could feel them. And I, I truly believe that to be true. Thank you for that question. So our next question, Lynn, is from Brian. Brian says, thank you. I listened to the podcast, This Land, and was excited that the Cherokee Nation won their Supreme Court case. Are there any cases or political battles upcoming for the Mohegan tribe that we should know about? Not at the moment, but you never know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, um, we have, we're buying land back and we're taking land back into trust. And I don't know if anyone's followed the case of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe who has land into trust and the previous administration uh, was taking steps to take it back out of trust, um, which was very, very painful for all of us because if you don't have a land base, how do you care for your people? How do you exercise jurisdiction for your people? How do you enforce your laws and ordinances if you have no land? And, and how do you exercise the grants that you, so for instance, they have a school on their land. Well, then what happens to the school? And um, so we were very worried about that case because it has such a, um, a major impact for all of us. Um, and we are buying our land back. We're buying our traditional lands back. And so we hope to take land into trust. But we do believe that um, we are working toward 
legislation that will ensure that no one can be, um, I, I would say, um, would would be um, unpredictable in terms of honoring those laws in, in the future. And um, so I would say that that's something to watch, you know, is, you know, land base for tribes and, and how um, this administration perhaps can codify that process so that we are not at risk again. Great. We have a question from Shelly. Um, she says, thank you, Chief Malerba. I appreciate your presentation. My daughter is a Leslie alum and never had a class or lecture focused on Native Americans. How can an institution like Leslie do a better job educating all students about the political status of tribes in the US? So here's a pet project of mine. Um, I think that every state and every high school should have um, a, a curriculum that talks about how this United States was formed and what this relationship is like. And, you know, and I think that could continue on um, to at the college and university level as well. Um, but I, I do think this is a great start. I think having uh, guest speakers to talk about different things and, and to share that we actually do exist in modernity. Um, you know, people talk about tribes as though they're people of the past, people of the forest, they no longer exist. You know, she is the last of her tribe. That's, you know, that's not the way it works. You know, we, we do live in modernity and we are, you know, political sovereigns and we're fortunate to still be here. Um, so I think, you know, having the dialogue is, is really important. Um, and, you know, I, and I think, have, I, you know, I, I went to Mohegan School as an elementary school child. And, you know, so in second grade, I'm singing, you know, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Because, you know, of course, I was a very shy kid. I wasn't going to tell anyone, you know, I wasn't going to tell my teacher, no, that's not quite right. You know, that Columbus discovered America. Um, so I think we just need to do a better job educating people. And I think the more you understand, you know, the rich diversity of the tribes, as well as the rich diversity of everyone in the United States, you know, we avoid so much heartache and pain. And, um, Oh, there's another question from Esta asking, can you tell us a bit about how you were elected chief? Well, that's a funny story. Um, in the old days, the chief and the chairman of the tribe were one and the same. So you, there was just one like head honcho, so to speak. Um, but my predecessor, Ralph Sturgis, um, as he aged, um, had done a lot of good work with the tribe. He was on council with my mom and that generation of Mohegans got us through the re-recognition process, as I call it, and helped establish our business, and which has allowed us to provide for our tribal people um, in a way that we've that that they only dreamed of in in years gone by. Imagine being able to provide your children scholarships. I, you know, they just couldn't have imagined the things that happened because of their hard work. And so they wanted to honor him, but he was, you know, not able to travel as much. And it was a really rough schedule for him. And so we had a constitutional change that said, well, we'll have a tribal council. We'll have a chief and, and other traditional leaders, um, such as the medicine woman, and we'll have a council of elders. And that's kind of the balance of power. And so the council of elders deal with our constitution and our culture. And, you know, they're very important. They're our Supreme Court. Um, and so they hear court cases. And so they're very important. And the tribal council runs the business and is the government entity that deals with the government to government relationships, both local, state, and federal. And so, um, so after Ralph passed, this is a long story, I guess. After Ralph passed, you know, there were, we had a very long period of mourning. It was three years. And, and the council of elders get to determine who the traditional leaders are. And and so they asked me and I was, you know, they asked all the tribal members, you know, who do you think it should be? So I diligently wrote a letter saying, I think it should be my mother. You know, she did some work for the tribe. Um, and they said, no, they wanted someone a little bit younger and they wanted somebody who would engage, you know, in different ways. And um, so I was very, very, very surprised. And um, when they called me down to their office, I thought maybe I was in trouble. Um, <laughs> and uh, when they asked me if I, Thought I might consider being chief, I was really shocked. I had to think about it for 24 hours because I thought, well, that means that, you know, what I originally planned is no longer what I'm going to be doing, which I hadn't really fulfilled my vision as the tribal chairwoman. And I certainly have a ton of opinions, as anyone who knows me would know. 
Um, but on the other hand, I thought this was such an opportunity and it's such an honor and following in the footsteps of my great grandfather. And, and I also thought how lovely for our young, you know, young Mohegan women to see a chief who's a woman. And so I felt as though the right answer was yes. And I, I did do a lot of soul searching and I asked my husband what I should do too. I brought home a bottle of champagne and said, should we celebrate or, you know, what, you know, what should we do with this? Um, and, you know, he, he being the very supportive person that he has said, I know you'll make the right decision. And so I've really enjoyed what I've been doing. It's hard for me to let go of the other stuff because again, I have lots of opinions. On the other hand, I'm able to engage in policy at a much deeper level and at the federal level. So I feel as though hopefully not only am I caring for my people, but I'm caring for all of the people throughout the United States. That's great. That's so fascinating to hear about how you made that decision. Um, so one, one other question from Mary Ann. Um, she asks, what are some of the immediate changes you hope our new Secretary of the Interior might put into place once she is confirmed by the Senate? Oh, oh Madam Secretary, we are so excited. Can you imagine? I mean, you want to talk about restorative justice? Let's have a Native person be be the, in charge of all of the interior. We are just thrilled. We consider Deb Hallen such a friend. She has worked so hard as a representative. And as a matter of fact, you know, I talked about the Broken Promises Report. She has legislation drafted to address all of the shortcomings in the Broken Promises Report that she had worked on with uh, Elizabeth Warren. And so of course, you know, we, we love them both and we, th we think they're great. I think what's really important to me is that she will ensure that proper consultation happens with tribes, number one. And number two, she will protect our sacred sites. And number three, she will insist that the United States do uphold their trust and treaty obligations to tribal nations. And that we will use our resources wisely and efficiently and that we will protect Mother Earth. And you heard her say that if you listen to her confirmation um, uh, hearings. That, that you know, we are here to protect Mother Earth. I've been reading a book called Braiding Sweetgrass and the author eludes me, but what she said was, until we start talking about our earth as an animate, as an animate person, as opposed to an inanimate object, we can't appreciate what it means to us. And we won't respect what we have been given us, uh, given to us as a gift. You know, Mother Earth is a gift to us and we need to protect her. Thank you. Um, let's see, let's pick one more. So could you speak, oh, this is from Pua, and Pua asks, could you speak to how respect for government to government treaty obligations could improve issues like the food deserts that you mentioned? Oh, exactly. So if we think about, you know, these food deserts, you know, what do we need to address that? We, you know, we need to partner with the USDA to develop, you know, farms, you know, good farms, you know, organic farms and roads to get to those farms. We need to help the communities provide for themselves. And so that's a very important piece of that, because if you can't provide your own food for your own people, you are going to be in this circumstance. And so there is a big uh, food sovereignty initiative these days. And it really is. How do we bring back our traditional foods? How do we make sure that we can provide the foods to our people that they need. Um, so I think that you know, it's going to be partnering with those agencies. And that's where I say it's got to be across the board. It's got to be with EPA. It's got to be with USDA. It's got to be with uh, transportation. You know, it, all of those things have to come into play. It has to be with FCC so that we have broadband. How are we going to teach our kids if we can't you know, have broadband to teach the kids? So that's where we need to get. We need to cut across all of those federal agencies Rather than having them all siloed, they, we need to get to the point of collaborating and making sure that the funding is there for the tribes to build the infrastructure to do just that. And Jay is asking, can you tell us more about the importance of Fidelia Fielding? So Fidelia Fielding was a very unique person. And at, at this moment, I'm gonna give a big shout out to Cornell University Library. Um, for anyone who knows Fidelia Fielding, 
she was the last uh, fluent speaker of the Mohegan language. And the reason that they didn't teach the next generations of Mohegan to speak Mohegan was because they were all experiencing severe prejudice and bias, and in some cases beaten for speaking their language. But Fidelia kept diaries in English and Mohegan, and she never spoke Mohegan to anyone who was not Mohegan. So if you were an English visitor, such as Frank Speck, who was the anthropologist, she was always speaking in English. But she kept these diaries in English and Mohegan, and I know it wasn't for herself and it wasn't for the generation of that day. It was for future generations to help remind us who we are because Native languages teach you about your culture and, and the, way, the phrasing and the, and the intonations and the underpinnings of those language help you understand your world in a very different way than English does. So her, Frank Speck took her, took her diaries um, and, and gave them to somebody for a safekeeping and their house, his house burned. In the meantime, Fidelia's adopted son during the pandemic flu of 1918 isolated and quarantined at her home. She was passed, she had passed by then and found another set of diaries um, unbeknownst to anyone that they existed. Somehow they, they were transferred um, and they ended up at the Cornell University. They, they went through a few transitions and they ended up at Cornell University. And so last year we approached the president of Cornell um, to say, you know, we're in the middle of a language restoration project and it would be so meaning for us, meaningful for us to have these diaries in our possession. And so we would love for you to consider transferring them back to us and then gifting them back to us. And so, you know, of course, you know, this is in late 2019 and boom, we bump up into the pandemic of 2020. We got a letter from her saying, well, we'd like you to meet with our um, head librarian, Gerald Beasley. So we had to do it on Zoom and, you know, we thought, oh, okay, you know, so we'll, we'll meet on Zoom. Well, with the very first meeting, what he said was, we've been so honored and, and pleased to be able to preserve these diaries, um, but we would love to give them back to you. I mean, it was just such an act of generosity and selflessness and we will forever be thankful to them um, for doing that. And so they, worked very hard with our archivists to, to devise a way to preserve and protect them in, trans, in transport. And we sent someone to Cornell. They weren't actually accepting um, you know, visitors, but they would accept one person. So our tribal historic preservation officer went to Cornell and they had a very brief ceremony um, to do the transfer. Um, and now they're back home. Fidelia's back home. Her spirit is home with us. And so we're we're thrilled. Uh, we're actually working with Jesse Little Dill Baird. I don't know if anyone is familiar with her. She received a Massachusetts Humanities Award, the Governor's Humanitarian Award for her work with Mashpee in restoring their language. And she's been very, very, very successful. Our languages are sister languages and you just change a consonant and, and it makes it Wampanoag or it makes it Mohegan. And so we now have our language warriors, as we call them, our language apprentices working with her. I'm taking classes, I'm not great at it, uh, but you know we are doing immersion classes and we're very excited. And so to have Fidelia home with us and her spirit home with us at this particular time is, is overwhelming and it gives us a great source of joy. That's really wonderful. Um, let's see, I have maybe a quick question from April. Do the Mohegans have any relation with any tribes in South America, specifically Colombia? Um, we do not actually, um, but interestingly, I do know that the Seneca Nation is working with an indigenous uh, tribe in South America and imports their coffee beans. Um, so I think that that's a great way to do tribal nation commerce, inter-tribal nation commerce and talk about on an international scale. I think it's fabulous. Yes, that's great. Um, okay, I think this is going to be our last question. Um, it's from Barbara. And Barbara asks, could you address the educational needs of your tribe's children and perhaps indigenous students in general? Well, there are huge needs. And, you know, so there is the Bureau of Indian Education um, throughout the United States, but they only serve 7% of the indigenous population. All of our students are in public schools. 
Um, and so we are kind of, you know, subject to the whims and the vagaries of what's going on in your own community in terms of education. Um, so, as I said, there is no curriculum. And so our students don't ever feel that they're reflected in history. And I think that that's a real deficit for them. I never felt it, you know, and it's interesting that, you know, even when you travel out West, I was in a meeting one time and there were Navajo leaders saying, oh, we didn't know that there were still tribes in Maine. Um, so, you know, there's this disconnect, you know, in terms of indigenous people nationwide. Um, and so I think, you know, our, our kids need to be reflected in the schools that they're in. Um, and so I think we need to do a better job with that. Um, and our Mohegan kids specifically are everywhere. So we're competing, you know, with everyone, you know, so we're competing with soccer and lacrosse and everything else to get them to our programs as well, because we don't have that one place. One of the things that we do have, which is a real blessing is a childcare center on our reservation that is open for our employees and our tribal members. Um, and so typically they try to group our tribal kids in our in in the, uh, the room together so they get to know one another and they get to grow up with one another and we as a tribe have a lot of robust programming for all of our children not only throughout the year but then in the summer too we have a very good summer program for toddlers and and kids that go to our summer camp and they learn language and they learn crafts and they learn about the culture and they learn about they get their family tree and, and from there, our high school kids and our college kids come work with us um, in various programs. And we provide a lot of internships for our college kids so that they can start building a resume. Janet, do you wanna close us out? I would very much like to do that. I wanna thank everyone who came this evening. Um, I wanna thank you for your wonderful questions. Um, I think they've really um, uh, uh, gotten us to understand a lot of the things um, that I get to talk to Lynn about from time to time. The story of um, Fidelia Fielding is one that I just always come back to, and I think it's just such an amazing story. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. Um, Lynn, I'm looking at the, the Q&A, and I'm seeing that people are just searching for <laughs> relatives to say uh, fantastic, fabulous, uh, um, you know, inspiring, awesome. Uh, so I, it, all those things and more, um, I feel like I've been transported back to our, um, our breakfast. And um, I thank you for that as well. So on behalf of all of us at Leslie, we are so deeply grateful to your joining us tonight and to what you shared with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll say, go be well. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.